fourth verse. Have faith in God, the whole world's filled about you. Have faith in God, he provides for his own. He will build the whole thing that shall perish.
as a country, as a church, maybe as individuals, we're all kind of going through some different stuff that maybe we've not ever went through before. Uh, none of us have been around with an 18-month pandemic. Uh, we've, we've, we've not went through what we're seeing on TV about Afghanistan for a minute. Um, what we're seeing right now is just, it looks like everybody's trying their absolute best, and it almost like the be our best isn't good enough. It's like nothing's really changing, and we've done everything that we're supposed to do, and it's like, you know, dude, what's, when's it going to change? When, when are things going to get it better? And believe it or not, there's a passage in Scripture in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4 where Paul just basically says, man, we, we, we give it our best shot all the time. It doesn't look like we're making any progress. We're, we're giving our best shot, and it doesn't look like we're getting further down the road. In fact, these are the words that Paul says. He says, but this precious treasure, talking about the, the gospel inside of us, talking about Jesus inside of us, talking about us being temples of the Holy Spirit, the, the good news that resides in us, this light and this power now shine inside of us. No matter what's going on out in the world, no matter how crazy things are, this thing inside of us is held in a perishable container. In fact, some Bibles say jars of clay. That is our weak bodies. Everyone can see that the glorious power within us must be from God because that power is not of our own. I want you to see the things that Paul just kind of stacks on top of one another, and we can find ourselves in this stack. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we're not crushed and broken. We're perplexed because we don't know why things happen as they do, but we don't give up and we don't quit. We're hunted down, but God never has abandons us. We get knocked down, but we get up again, and we keep going. We always carry around in our body the death of Christ. We always carry around in our body Good Friday so that Easter Sunday, so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body. Church, we can be going through the most difficult time in our life. Pressed down. Can't get back. Uh, uh, we, we get knocked down. We, we get pressed down and we get... Uh, uh, perplexed and things like that. But the truth of the matter is, not only do we have the suffering of Good Friday living inside of us, but we also have the power of Easter Sunday morning. We have them both. I want to look at what, we, what do we do or what can we learn about these things or these times in our life where, man, our, our best isn't good enough. This is the first thing I want to help you with is this. You need to expect bad things to happen. You just simply need to expect for things to get sideways from time to time. It's the way it is. And don't be surprised when the bottom drops out. Paul said that there are troubles on every side. And this sounds a whole lot like to me the, a, a situation that, that we're facing. We're continually facing the pandemic thing, the danger of life-threatening infection. We're seeing the economic collapse around us. And at the same time, as a nation, we're seeing racial riots and we're seeing the injustice thing and we're seeing social upheaval and we're seeing controversial elections and vaccine issues and mask issues. Are we going to close down in September? Man, we're just surrounded by troubles. We don't know what things will look like in November, let alone next week. This is just where we find ourselves. And even as Christians, we might feel a little helpless. We feel a little confused. Hey, we might feel a little angry, a little frustrated, overwhelmed by things the government is or isn't doing or what the public is or isn't doing. And how do we handle it? How do we fit into it? Peter warned us a long time ago. He said this. He said, dear friends, don't be what? He said, dude, don't be surprised if bad things happen. Don't be surprised the fiery arrows or darts overwhelm you dear friends don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange has happened to you the apostle peter the beloved the one who jesus said upon this rock i'll build my church that dude saint peter the one who preached on the day of pentecost that dude the one who the one who was in jesus's inner circle along with peter james and john 
Peter said, don't be surprised, man, when things go wrong. In fact, expect it. Be ready for it to go wrong. Back when I was a kid, I used, to leave, I used to love to read things about Harry Houdini. As a little kid, he was just an amazing guy. And one of the things this great illusionist did in the last century is that he would go from town to town doing these things. That's how he made a living, fed his wife. Um, he would go to these towns, and he would look for the biggest man on campus. And this particular time, he was at McGill, uh, McGill University. And the biggest guy on campus came up and, and sucker punched him uh, when Houdini wasn't looking, wasn't prepared. What he would typically do is when he would do this particular stunt, he would flex his muscles and uh, he would flex his abdomen and he would get the muscles tight and it was just as hard as a rock. The guy was an incredible athlete and he, would, he could take that punch and it was like hitting a brick wall. Didn't matter how big it was. That's how much control that Houdini had over his body. He went to this McGill University. Some guy came and said, hey, Mr. Houdini, popped him right in the gut, exploded his appendix and he died about nine days, 11 days later, something like that. But the reason he died is because he wasn't ready for what was coming. Any other time, the dude would have been ready and it would have been all right. Any other time, he would have been prepared. Any other time, he would have been expecting it. But when he wasn't expecting it, birds, when it killed him. The apostle Peter says, church, be aware that bad times are going to come. You see, it's the hardships that we don't see coming that usually pop us. It's the one that we're not anticipating that usually get us down. In some Christian circles... There's some false advertising going on. What do you mean by that? They say, well, if you're close to God, then you're going to be okay. If you're close to God, you're walking, you've got enough faith, you'll never get sick. If you're walking close to God, you're going to have all kinds of money because God's <laughs> plans are for you to prosper. Church, can I tell you something? I know plenty of Christians who are sick. Good Christians, faithful Christians. What I just described to you is what's something called the prosperity gospel. Church, the prosperity gospel is not in the gospel, but I will tell you what is. Acts 14:22. We must go through many what? On our way to where? Church, we have to expect a certain level of hardships. We have to expect that, hey man, some things are going to get sideways. Sometimes things are just going to fall uh, out the bottom. Sometimes things are, are not going to stack up the way we want them to. God can bring something good out of every single one of those hardships. Biologists have come up with a term called the adversity principle. It means this, any particular animal or species of animal, if it doesn't have any hardships, it typically doesn't get any stronger. The adversity principle means this, any time a species or an animal or a herd or a group or a flock go through difficult times, they seem to accept. Christian, you and I, our growth doesn't happen when there's no adversity. Our growth happens when our heart's broken. Our growth happens when we're crying. Our growth happens when we're going through the stuff. Our growth happens when things aren't going right. You see, church, there is no triumph without the trial. There's no testimony without the test. There is no empty tomb without the crucifixion. We go through them all to get to that blessing. Church, growth doesn't happen in the mountaintops. It happens in the valleys where the trials are, the troubles are, the setbacks are, the defeats are, the shadow of the valley of death. That's where the growth occurs in life. And we are in a spiritual war with deadly foes attacking us every hour. There's no, there's, there's no, uh, there's no, re there's no doubt why Ephesians 6, 12 says we do not fight against flesh and blood. But we fight against spirit, uh, spiritual principalities in the high places. That is what we fight. There is a spiritual battle going on. And I want you to understand something. Have you ever said something or looked up something on the internet? Or you could just be speaking in your car. Hey, Pam, have, is there any place around us that has vans on sale? Vans or shoes? We'll be talking. And the next thing you know, you know what comes up on our, on our Facebook feed? Places where vans are on sale. Y'all, you think Google tracks you or Facebook tracks you? It ain't got nothing on the devil. He is watching you at all times. And by the way, the devil can't be everywhere at one time. That's why he has demons. Okay? God can be everywhere at one time. The devil wants you to think that he's as powerful as God, but that dude's a liar. But the devil has you under surveillance. He's looking to see what we do, what we think, where we go, what we say. And we need to be in the best shape possible because in this battle, the enemy is gathering intelligence on us. We need to be in the best shape as warriors as possible because when the darts are thrown and when the arrows are thrown, we don't want them to hurt us when they come our way. Now, this is what happens when there's pampered, overindulged, flabby Christians who just have enough stamina to come to church, not enough stamina to go to the battlefield. Church, the Lord puts us on a spiritual treadmill every now and then to keep us in fighting condition. And that treadmill, by the way, is not a place for us to lay our clothes. 
the treadmill is it the treadmill is adversity <laughs> we sold some exercise equipment a couple of years ago and i said this this exercise equipment must go to make room for more exercise more exercise equipment that will be sold at a later time um, <laughs> that's a true story that's the adversity principle that we're all affected by one way or another the adversities help us grow don't be shocked when they come during the reign of Bloody Mary, she was a, a brutal queen. There was an Englishman. He was a Protestant. Bloody Mary wasn't. His name was Bernard Gilbin. Uh, Bloody Mary, the queen, had sent out uh, a death warrant, if you will, to so bring this dude in. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna get rid of him. And uh, when the guards went to Gilpin's house, he broke his leg going out. I don't know what the deal was, but he broke his leg going out. And this dude's a solid Christian. And the guards are saying, <laughs> you broke your leg going out, some Christian. You are some God. You've got blah, blah, blah. And uh, so they, they had to wait there a day or so for him to get his, his, leg, uh, his leg wrapped up. And so they start going back towards London where the queen is because they've called for this, this gilpin to come in. On his way there, the queen dies. The next person who takes the, the throne is a Protestant. Her name is Queen Elizabeth. When they get there, Queen Elizabeth looks at him and says, you're fine, go back to your church. And on the way out of the court, Gilpin looks at the guards who say, yeah, some God you are. He said, look what God did with my broken leg. Church, God will use whatever mess comes in our life for, his good, for our good and his glory. Don't be scared, don't be shocked when bad things happen or it looks like the bottom has dropped out. Our God will always use our pain, always use our adversity, always use our tears, always use these things to make us stronger. Number two, expect to overcome in those hardships. Don't expect to lose. You expect to overcome. God is our champion is why I tell you to expect to overcome. Paul assured every believer that no enemy is ever greater than the power of God. No disease, no divorce, no separation, no bad news, no firing, no job. Nothing is more powerful than our God. Church, Romans 8.31 says this. And the answer is no. If our God is for us, then who can be against us? The obvious answer is nobody. If God's on your side, there's not somebody bigger and more powerful out there. You've got the biggest guy on campus backing you up. There is no power that can equal God's. There was an old country preacher, and he was preaching his little heart out there in the front of the church, and there was a, a well-educated, uh, cynical critic who came in. He said, Preacher, you just preached an hour talking about how your God is, is bigger than anything. You just preached for an hour how you Christians are more than conquerors and more than victorious through Christ. But have you read the newspaper lately? Have you seen what's going on over there? Have you seen the, the hurt that's going on out west and the hurt that's going on out east? Have you not read what's going on in the world? It sure doesn't look like your God is in power. It sure doesn't look like your God is in control. And the old uneducated country preacher said, well, I'll tell you what, son. I read the front of the book and God's in control there and then I went to the back of the book and I looked at the end and he's all powerful and in control there and I just got to assume in between there was nobody big enough to whip him church there ain't nobody big enough to whip our God Amen. wasn't at the beginning there sure won't be in the end and church there ain't nobody big enough now that's our champion that's who we have fighting for us that's who has our back, our front, our north, our south, our east, and our west. And you may be being knocked down. You may feel like you have been, you may have been knocked to the mat. But listen to me, even in a, bo even in a boxing match, just because you get knocked down doesn't mean you've lost. Because you can get back up. And you go after the opponent again and you knock them down, you can still win. Church, you may have been down, but you're not out. And I'll prove it to you because you're still taking in air. You're still above ground. Victory is getting up one more time than when you got knocked down. Remember, there's no empty tomb without the crucifixion. Here's the good thing. You've got that living resurrection power in your veins too. Moses told the Israelites, and I love this particular translation, Deuteronomy 6.23, that God brought us out of Egypt to bring us into and give us the land he promised as an oath to our ancestors. Church, that's what God is going to do for you, Cooner. Bird, that's what God's going to... It's now dawned on me. i got a Cooner on one side and a bird on the other. That's what God does for us. He brings us out of something to take us to something. He's not going to leave us over there. He's not going to leave us in the hardship. He's not going to leave us in the loss. He's not going to leave us in the sorrow. The only way we stay there is if we decide to stay there. So as God is our champion, he leads us out and he lifts, he lifts, he lifts us up. 
Pastor, I don't know what you're talking about. I can't even sense God in my struggles. Preacher, I don't know what you're talking about. I know all these things. I've heard these things before, but I don't even sense His presence. Church, listen to me. There may be times in your hardship you don't see God. There may be times in your hardship that you can't get a clear sight of God. But let me tell you something. Just because you can't see Him, it doesn't mean He doesn't see you. Doesn't mean He don't see your hardship or where you're at. The time comes when you feel like He's the furthest away from you is what I found. Is this one of the times He's actually closest to me. When I feel like I've been abandoned or forgotten, God says, son, I'm right here. You're in the center of my hands. Here's the thing, church. In our weakness, we rely on his strength. And when we rely on his strength, we may never fail. He will bear us up in his arms. Thirdly, here we go. Expect hard times. Expect things to go sideways. Number two, we talked about you are an overcomer. Number three, expect to be lifted up in your times of trial. Testing is defined as this. If you test something, you're determining the quality of something. If you test something, you're determining the value of it or the character of it. God has all kinds of reasons to allow testing or trials or adversity to come our way because he's strengthening our faith. Now, why would God do that? Why would God put us in a hardship in order for us to, to be equipped? Here's, here's a couple of reasons. Number one, God will use our hardships as a teaching tool. You see, trials inform us of our weakness. When we're going through this stuff, what begins to happen is we see the, the thin spots in our armor. We begin to see the thin spots or the places we're not covered where arrows can come in or darts can be thrown at us. Whether it's lust, whether it's gluttony, whether it's addiction, whether it's relapse, whether it's anger, whether it's pride. That devil who has you under constant surveillance, he knows exactly where he needs to try to slip that arrow in at. God will send us hardships as teaching tools so we will be better equipped and better armored. There are things we learn in adversity that we can learn no other way. Those times of adversity show us just how brief and momentary the things of this life are. Church, here's an amazing thing. The biggest trouble you have will not follow you to heaven. The biggest loss you've ever had will not follow you to heaven. It just doesn't. So these things are teaching tools preparing us for there. Number two, they're for strength building. Just as an athlete starts with small weights and builds up for endurance. Church, the trouble I have now, I look back when I was eight years old. The biggest problem I remember ever having as an eight-year-old is whether my FM signal would come in from St. Louis on KWK. All right? That was what freaked me out as an eight-year-old. As, as an old man now, I'll just turn on Bluetooth and listen to the satellite. That ain't no problem no more. My problems are a little bit different now as an old man than what they were as an eight-year-old. You see, but the thing is, I can handle these things a little bit better now as an old man because of what God told me and got what God taught me growing up. Don't ever think that God wastes any of our hardships or our tests or our adversities. He's using them to strengthen us. Our adversity is training. Number three, teaching tools are for strength building. Number three, they're for character development. The uh, John Bevere, he's the, teacher of the pers uh, he's the teacher of the bait of Satan that we're doing. He talked about how uh, rings, gold in particular, um, you know, if, you're, if you've got a 24-carat gold ring, it's a pure gold. It's pure gold. All 24 carats of it are. Um, if you have a 10-carat gold ring, it means 10 parts out of that 24 is pure gold. The other 14 carats are zinc or nickel or iron and things like that. And it looks pure, but if you would put this in a, in a cauldron and heated it to 7,000 degrees all that zinc and nickel and iron would float to the top and the, uh, the smelter could come up with his ladle and scrape off all the impurities and what's left would be that, that, uh, that beautiful pure gold. Church, when we go into the fire of infirmity, when we go into the fire of adversity, what happens is all of those impurities that built into us, whether it's sin, whether it's anger, lust, whatever it would be, as, as the adversity heats up our heart, those things come to the top. The weak things in our armor float up and if we let God, what he'll do is with that adversity and the, the impurities coming up, he will, he will take those off. He will scrape them off the top of his ladle of grace. But here's the thing. We don't get that unless we go in the fire. We don't get that unless we walk through the adversity. We don't get that unless we walk through the flames. And it's there where the character development, uh, it's where the character development takes place. Fourthly, to bring us closer to him. 
We go through those trials because when we're down and out, we need Him all the time. When we're down and out, we pray more. When we're down and out, we're in the Word more. When we're down and out, we seek Him out to get closer to Him. There was a little girl who would come home and every night before she would go to bed, uh, she would drive her mom nuts. She would take off her shoes and throw them underneath the bed. This happened for two nights, three nights, four nights, went into two weeks and made the mother angry because every morning she woke up, the little girl was always looking for something underneath the bed. It made her late for school and things like that. So one night, mama came home, all the kids kids are, are uh, fed and bathed and hurry up and get in the bed. It's late. they got to go to school in the morning. And sure enough, that little girl goes to the bedroom, throws her shoes underneath her bed, and mom blows a stack. Honey, what are you doing? Every night you do that. Every morning you've got to go looking for them. What are you doing that for? Do I need to take you to a doctor? Do you need a patch? What do you need? The little girl said, no, mama, my Sunday school teacher told me that I need to start every morning on my knees. And she said that if I put my shoes underneath my bed, first thing I'm going to do when I get out of bed is I'm going to get on that floor and I'm going to look for them shoes. And it reminds me to pray. Church, sometimes it's in those adversities that will bring us to our knees. And when we're on our knees, it reminds us that we've got to look up, take His hand, and be in prayer, and be in trust. Church, that's what God does. He gets us on our knees by trials so that He will keep us close to Him. Lastly, He wants to make a new vessel out of us. You ever seen a potter build a beautiful vase on that table? He or she will build it and mold it. It doesn't always turn out right. And what they do is they don't throw that clay away. They'll let it get hardened. Then they'll crush it, reconstitute it, and use it again. Give it another try. Till it eventually develops this beautiful vase. Church, you and I, sometimes we get crushed, don't we? And we just get broken to pieces. And we feel like there's no hope, there's no future, there's no further journey for us. This is the end of the road. And God's saying, baby, that's the furthest thing from the truth there possibly is. I'm going to take all your broken pieces and I'm going to build a brand new vessel out of you. And it'll be better than it was to begin with. Amen. Church, whenever God fixed something, it's better than what it was the first time. In fact, you want to look at the new earth? Woo! It's a whole lot better than this one. Beware if you've had no trials. Beware if everything's going right in your life. Because you know what that means? That means you're not putting up enough trouble to the devil for him to worry about you. You're not praying. You're not a threat to His kingdom because you're not doing anything in His kingdom. Pastor, I don't have any troubles with the devil. He leaves me alone. It might be because the devil won't spur a dead horse. Just a thought. You don't believe me. I want you to listen to what, the de I want you to, listen to what Jesus says. Don't believe my words. Leave the words in red. The Lord said this. Y'all need to watch out if all men speak well of you. You know what that means? As a Christian, if you're not being salt, and you're not being light, and you're not causing a ruffle where you are by being love and patient and kind and forgiving and being the epitome of grace, if we're not being different than the world, then they're not going to talk about us. But what Jesus is saying, if, if you're being a Christian, if you're a being a follower of me, there will be people who won't like you. There will be people who won't care for you. In fact, Matthew 5 says this, Don't forget you're the salt of the earth and you are the light of the earth. Church, don't lose your saltiness. Don't lose your light. We should be bringing spice into this life. Beautiful and valuable pearls. Beautiful and valuable pearls are the result of this inside of an oyster. A, a sand, a piece of sand gets in there and begins to irritate the muscle inside that oyster. Begins to irritate the inner lining of that oyster. And what it begins to do is that oyster will immediately, uh, will immediately begin secreting a milky substance around that grain of sand or that pebble or that rock. And what will happen is over the life of that, that oyster, it will just add more layers of that milky secretion that solidifies. And before too long, that, 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 little, piece of gran, uh, gr that little piece of sand that irritant becomes a hard pearl. Now, that pearl is a response to the irritation. It has built a pearl out of a response to the hardship. 
It has built a pearl to protect itself. Now, church, that protection is grace. That protection is in that, that oyster every time it gets poked by the world. Church, God's grace for us, every time we get poked, we should respond. Uh, we want to respond with hate. We want to respond with rage. We want to respond uh, out, out of our hurt. But God is saying, don't do that. I know it hurts. Let me give you some grace. Let me put some grace around that thing that's aggravated you. Let me put some grace around that thing that has hurt you. Let me put some grace around that thing that's causing you to cry. Let me, let, let me put some grace around that thing that's causing you so much trouble. Similarly, Paul was praying, Lord, give me, take away this thorn in my flesh. And you remember what God said? My grace is sufficient for you. You know what God did? He released that milky secretion called grace and wrapped it around that thorn. And before too long, Paul said, I'll just go ahead and keep it. Because now I can rely on you. It reminds me to rely upon your strength. Church, the devil brings trials with the purpose of making you feel angry, making you feel bitter, making you feel irritated, making you feel angry. And God is saying, let me take that and wrap it in your grace. Now, if you turn every bad circumstance into a reason for praising God, if you turn your circumstances as a way for God's grace to be manifest in your life, if every time something bad happens to you, you run to God, i got a question to ask you. Do you think the devil's going to keep fighting you? He knows you're going to run home and tell Dad. Church, when we get this thing down on lock, and we realize that when these things happen to us, instead of festering, instead of, uh, instead of considering these things at all the time, what if we just went to God and said, God, I need some grace for this. This person hurt me. Can you give me grace? This person wounded me. Can you give me grace to cover that? And this is an amazing thing. That pearl represents the grace surrounding and, and covering that, that hurt. You ever read what, what heaven looks like? All the beautiful streets of gold and the crystal river and the throne of God in the center surrounded by the angels. Holy, holy, holy. But on the outside of heaven, Kunder, there are gates. And the Bible is very clear with what the gates are made out of. The walls are jasper, but the gates are what? What are they? What if the reason kin their pearls is this? What if God's trying to tell us Hey, baby, when you get through the gates, all them things that we covered up in grace, they're staying out. That hurt, that divorce, that trial, that injury, you don't bring them in with you. That injury, you don't bring them in. Man, what if when we go to heaven, we're reminded of all those things that grace took care of down here? You see, some of them pearls in those gates are yours, Carrie. Carrie. Some of them pearls in that gates are yours, Ken. Some of them pearls are yours, Kuna. God is wanting us to know that I've covered all that stuff. Welcome home. You don't have to take anything in here. Today, we've looked at times when we've done our absolute best, given it our all, and our struggles are still there. I've given you three words of encouragement. Expect trials. Number two, expect to overcome them. And number three, Expect to be lifted up. Trust God, church, because he's working all things for your good. If I could have every head bowed and every eye closed. This morning, if you have a need for, for prayer, maybe you're going through a time of trial now, a time of adversity, a time of affliction. Maybe you've given it your absolute best shot, but you're, you're still in a situation where nothing has changed. Things are still, uh, things are still difficult. Things are still hard. Things are still uh, arduous. Hey, man, doesn't mean God doesn't love you. Doesn't mean God has forgotten about you. Are you going through a time of trial right now? Do you need some special grace to deal with your situation? Do you need a special dispensation of grace to cover up that irritant that's, that's poking in your life? I want you to remember, there may be times where you don't know where God's at, but there's never a time that God doesn't know where you are. Maybe you're here today and you feel like you and God aren't as close as you used to be, but you'd like to be. If you would, I just want to ask you to lift your hand. You can put it right back down. I'm just going to pray for you. Thank you. See him in the back. See him on the side. Anyone else? 
Thank you. You can put them right back down. Thank you. I'm not going to ask you to come up front. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to pray for every hand that's raised. See, the thing is, with a public demonstration of simply raising your hand, you're making a public commitment. I see that hand. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Anyone else? Heavenly Father, I want to pray for every hand that was raised today. Father, maybe they felt closer to you in the past as they do now, uh, but they don't now. I pray that there would be a time of refreshing and revival for those relationships. Lord, I pray for that man or that woman or that student who's so frustrated because they've, they've given their best, but things haven't changed. And they're growing frustrated and they're losing heart. Exactly what the enemy wants to do. Exactly what the enemy wants to accomplish. So Lord God, I pray that you would just roll into their life right now. Establish your peace. Establish your power. Establish your grace. And give them encouragement in the name of Jesus, Lord. Lord, draw us close to you, even while we're going through the stuff. And I release blessing into this room, Father. I pray that you would do another miracle by giving us hope in the hardship. Sing that chorus together, Mrs. Jacob. Just that chorus, trust and obey. Trust and obey. so much for coming this morning Wednesday night we will be on session three in debate of Satan you know this has been a phenomenal phenomenal connect group people are being changed and transformed in that letting hurt go uh, if you've not been to any of them please come Wednesday night we will have hamburgers uh, potato salad, potato salad uh, french fries and cheese fries we'd love to have you that's from five to six and then at six o'clock we'll jump in you're saying we'll preach I've not been to any of the connect groups it's okay. You're going to get something out of whatever connect group you go to. It's like coming to a series on Sunday morning. You may not have heard the first two sermons, but you'll get something out of the last one. Or maybe you missed one and three, but you'll get something out of number two. It's okay. Um, so come Wednesday night. We would really, really love to have you. And those groups are growing. I think we had 40 people last week. It's crazy. So uh, we would really encourage you to come. That's all I have. God bless you. Thank you for coming. And... Uh, Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for this time we've been together. And God, I just pray that you would just be glorified in our life, even in the adversity, Father, even, even more so in the adversity. Let yourself and your power and your glory be made known and made, made manifest. Father, we love you. Thank you for going through the hard times with us. Thank you for going through the valley, of the, chef, uh, the valley of the shadow of death with us. Thank you for being the shepherd that takes us by the cold waters and the still waters and, and just being the keeper and the comforter of our soul. Thank you for knowing us by name, Lord. What an incredible God you are. We love you. Thank you so much for your, 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 your love for us. It's in Jesus' name. And amen.